Uh, today we're going to go over uh, section two, which is on interdependence. If you remember back from all the way back into the fall, we talked about interdependence, about how organisms depend on one another. And then now today we're going to talk about how they relate with one another to help uh, the ecosystems in which they live. So the first thing we need to talk about is we talk about this term niche. Okay, and that is really the specific range of conditions under which a species can survive. Okay, if you think of an animal that might be up in uh, the North Pole area, they're obviously going to have a different range of conditions that allow them to survive versus an animal that might be in the jungle. They have a lot more things that they may have to maneuver around in order to survive and reproduce. And this is always determined by what we call limiting factors. Okay, so what are limiting factors? All right, these control how much each population can survive. Okay, and we're talking about food, we're talking about shelter, we're talking about water, other predators, mates. So if you think about humans, the limiting factors we have, it's all of these things. Okay, do we have many predators? No, we don't, other than maybe ourselves. Okay, but the amount of food, the amount of water, these are things that we need in order to survive. And every animal, every species is in some way going to be controlled by these different factors. Okay. Now, there's two specific types that you need to know. There's density independent factors and density dependent factors. Density independent factors means okay, that the population is going to be affected no matter what the size of the population is. Okay, this is mainly meaning that there was a natural disaster, a fire, a flood, um, some type of deep freeze, etc. So no matter if there were a thousand of that species or a million of that species, it's going to be affected because of this natural disaster that took place. Okay, you can see some examples down there. Now if we're talking about density dependent factors, okay, this limits the population once it reaches a certain size. Okay, an example is because of predators, because of competition, because of when I hear when I say here toxic waste accumulation, we're talking more about fish. Okay, the, because of maybe there's mercury in the amount of water in a body of water, so you can only have a certain number of fish in this body of water because you don't want to have too much mercury. When we talk about this, uh, what happens if there's not enough resources, which is again density dependent, um, we talk about competition. Okay, and competition as we know it is when these niches overlap organisms, okay, they must compete for their resources. Now there's something called the competitive exclusion principle. This means that no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. Okay, if we go back at the previous slide, okay, you see down there that you have uh, the alligator um, and the lion. Uh, they may both hunt the wildebeest, but they're not actually occupying the same niche as it says in this competitive exclusion principle. The lion is going to basically kind of rule on land, whereas the alligator crocodile is going to be uh, more in the water. Now, yes, it can come out, but its niche and what it, its habitat is is in the water. Okay. Um, we talk about lions and tigers, and really when we talk about this, this is something we talked a little bit more in the evolution unit. Um, we said that they were once one species, but then as the lions went south into more of the plains desert area of Africa, and the tigers went a little bit more east and went into Asia and the Middle Eastern countries, um, they became two different species. They kind of pushed each other away in order to evolve into something a little bit more. So again, how do organisms depend on each other? Another example, um, we have here uh, the wolf. The wolf is what's known as, uh, or and I'll talk about more of the keystone species here in just a second, but um, predators affect the size of the prey populations in a community to determine the places they can live and feed. Okay, so if we look at how this wolf is in, important, you might look at this and say, well, the grassland, etc. what in the world is a wolf going to do to control this? Because the wolf is not going to eat the grass, so you think that it's going to um, really get, quite, get along quite well. But what happens is, is the wolf is going to control everything else that eats the grass. Okay, so if we take uh, this elk, for example. 
Um, if the wolf does not eat the elk, what happens to the grassland? Think about that. Okay. Um, the wolf, as I said, is known as a keystone species. And what keystone species means is that it is an organism that limits the size of every other population, keeping the ecosystem in balance. Okay, keystone species, because if you look at this keystone up here that's any archway, this is what keeps that archway from falling down. Okay, and that's more of a whole physics lesson. We won't get into that right now. But back to that original question. If the uh, you take away the wolf, what happens is the elk population gets out of control. What happens if the elk population gets out of control? What does it eat? Well, now the grassland becomes barren. Okay, so you have to then add back in the wolf because if you have the barren uh, land now, the, as you just saw, the elk population is going to disappear. So it's why this keystone species of the wolf is extremely important in this ecosystem. Okay, uh, population size. I have a term called carrying capacity. What carrying capacity means is that's basically the size of a population of any species that can be supported by those resources that are available. Okay, if there's too many of that species in that population and there's not enough resources, it's going to be harmful to the organism, which it will die off, or it's going to be harmful to the environment, which is going to, as we saw with the elks, it's going to eat all the grass. So it's going to be harmful to that environment. Okay, so what controls the carrying capacity? That's the limiting factors. So now we're putting in multiple of these vocabulary terms that you have for this part of the unit. Symbiosis. Okay, symbiosis is a relationship between two or more species. Um, you're going to have an activity that you need to complete. Um, if you go on to YouTube and you uh, probably put a link on Schoology with this video. It's a clever video. You can watch it um, with a little song, a little catchy tune, if you want something to watch on your Thursday, um, with a, a little purple hippo, which explains what symbiosis is. But your assignment, what you need to do is you need to go to the link that I supply in the symbiosis activity assignment, and you need to find three examples from each of the different types of symbiotic relationships. We're going to go through those types right now and then just kind of give me a brief explanation. First thing you have is you have mutualism. Mutualism is a relationship where both of the organisms are going to benefit. If you see this picture that's here uh, up top, you notice that there is a rhino and then there's going to be the birds on the back. Well, both are going to benefit because the birds may come down and eat what's on the back of the rhino and the rhino gets cleaned at the same time. So this is a plus 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 type of relationship again known as mutualism. You have another one which is called commensalism. Commensalism is where one organism organism benefits and the other one is neither hurt or uh, helped. For example, in a field, um, you have buffalo or you have cattle that are going to run through a field and they're going to they're going to kick up a bunch of worms or small animals. Then the birds will come along and they will eat those worms or small animals. So what you have is you have the the birds which get fed and then you have the cattle or the buffalo which is neither hurt or helped it's just running through the land okay again that's commensalism and then you have parasitism or parasites the relationship where one organism benefits and the other one um, is basically harmed and this would be ticks leeches lice um, lice is really just a phobia um, that we have as humans lice really don't hurt us and they're not a sign of if someone is dirty, they're just a, uh, a nuisance. And if you've ever had um, or been involved with someone in your household having it, you know how much of a nuisance it can be. But it doesn't mean someone's dirty. Um, it, it commonly lives in uh, warm, uh, moist places. So the scalp and hair is a common place for lice to develop. And it happens a lot in elementary schools. It happens on baseball, softball teams because of the sharing of helmets. Um, the sharing of hats. Uh, but again, that is a, an example of parasitism because it has to li live on and feed off of the individual and will basically suck the blood out of the scalp of the human. But it cannot and it does not hurt the human. Um, again, this is that uh, link that will be on. Uh, um, ignore this two examples because I'm asking you to do three. Um, 
but that's going to be on Schoology. Last part here, okay, are what we're talking about with different uh, levels of organisms, okay, producers. Producers are going to be down at the bottom. They're going to make the food. You have autotrophs, which make their own energy from the sun, okay, Ma mainly uh, plants. Uh, photoautotrophs, a little more specific, use the sun, whereas chemoautotrophs use chemicals to make their own em energy. Most of us, or all of us, are known as consumers because we cannot make our own food. Um, we have to eat uh, something else to get energy, okay, which we are known as heterotrophs. If you take zoology class, um, then you will learn a little bit more about these different animals and the different types of animals. Couple terms, and you've probably heard these terms before, but so this will be a review. I'll go pretty quick through this. You have herbivores, which means they eat mainly or only plants. You have carnivores, which means they eat uh, mainly meat. Omnivores, which are mostly humans, most of us, not all of us, we eat plants and animals. And then detritivores or decomposers, which means you eat dead and decaying material. So, in conclusion, you can answer these questions, and then you also have. Uh, the answer to those questions, which are uh, on this uh, key points, key terms that are in the last slide. Um, when you have a chance, get those couple assignments finished. Let me know what questions you have or if you need some additional help. Uh, have a great day, guys.